Buenos días, buen día, good morning, and welcome to HPE Discover Barcelona. I'm Alfredo Yepes, Senior Vice President and Marine Director for Latin America, Southern European countries, and also the Marine Director for Julio Packard Enterprise in Spain. Thank you so much for joining us here in this beautiful country. Spain and the surrounding region are tremendously important for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. This country has a well-developed manufacturing sector, including production of automobiles, aerospace components, and electronics. And Barcelona is home of the growing number of innovative startups and also the home of large technology companies, being Hewlett Packard Enterprise, one of them. It is a region rich on diversity, and the industry here continue to pursue transformation, the digital transformation, in an accelerated pace and a scale. Every individual in this room, and many who have joined us virtually, play vital roles on your organization and also with your own customers. This week, you will have the opportunity to engage with industry-leading experts to guide you and inspire you on modernizing your enterprise from the edge to the cloud. To assist, we are joined by some of the HPE's top technologies, solution engineers, advisory professionals, and the technical partner community. Most importantly, we have many customers who are available to meet with you and share their insights, expertise, and learning. This week is about unlocking the power and the value of all of your data, wherever it lives, while straightening the, your data sovereignty, security, and environmental sustainability. HPE Discover Barcelona is packed with an insightful section designed to ensure you learn from your peers and our experts find solutions to your biggest challenges and ultimately live here with fresh ideas to accelerate your business. So get ready to connect, get ready to expand your relationship, and have a lot of fun along the way. With that, it's a great pride that I now welcome to the stage our keynote speaker. So please put your hand together and welcome the President and CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Mr. Antonio Neri. Good morning, Antonio. Hola, hola, Alfredo, how are you? Very well. Gracias. Gracias, Alfredo, and bienvenidos to all. Welcome to HP Discover Barcelona, where we will connect, learn, and imagine what comes next. And that next is clearly AI. Soon we will live in a world where AI will enable us to create solutions to some of the biggest societal challenges and accelerate business transformation across every industry. Imagine a future where every business decision is enabled by AI. A future where predictive analytics drive new levels of productivity, help you make better and faster decisions and predict trends that open new business opportunities. AI will be the most disruptive technology of our lifetime, even bigger than mobile, web 1.0, and the cloudware. It will accelerate opportunities at scale never before seen, transforming the way we live and work in unimaginable ways. During our time together today, we will discuss this incredible technology, its challenges, such as its ethics, and the importance of designing it with sustainability in mind from the beginning. Also, we show how HPE is transforming and innovating to help you create and adopt the right AI strategy for your organization. Alongside game-changing customers and inspirational leaders, uh, I will show you how, why a data-first strategy that is AI-native and hybrid by design is essential to your success. Together, we will explore, explore the possibilities of tomorrow, taking 
the first step into a future that's only limited by the boundaries of our own creativity. But first, let's briefly step back in time and revisit the journey we have been on. When I became CEO nearly six years ago, I said that the enterprise of the future will be edge-centric, cloud-enabled, and data-driven. We were the first to say the edge will be the next frontier. Since the beginning, we have had a consistent thread in our networking strategy, which is to deliver a secure, mobile-first, cloud-first experience. HP Aruba Networking is now a leading customer choice for secure connectivity in campus and branch, and most recently in the data center and private cloud. HP Aruba Networking has also been named by Gartner as a leader in the wire and wireless magic quadrant, guess what, for 17 years in a row. The edge is where most of the real-time data processing happens. In the campus and branch networking segment, we have expanded to software-defined wider network and security through our acquisitions of Silver Peak and Access Security. NHB now leads in the SD1 and Secure Access Services Edge markets. Additionally, with our acquisition of Athernet, we are extending our wireless uh, reach into private 5G, enabling highly distributed coverage when density is required. In the data center and cloud networking segment, we invested organically to address the most pressing challenges related to applications and infrastructure that require intelligent east to west traffic. We have executed an aggressive innovation agenda with your needs in mind, accelerating your ability to deliver business outcomes for your enterprise. So as you saw, by deploying the right edge to cloud connectivity and AI inferencing, we have enabled Tottenham, the, the, the Tottenham Club, to fully automate and digitize their operations, allowing the club to leverage the large amount of data created on each game day to generate new business opportunities while providing a safe and fun experience. In addition to the edge, we also say the world will be hybrid. Organizations now realize that different types of workloads belong in different locations, but all require a cloud-native experience. Data is increasingly regulated, and data sovereignty and cost will dictate the location of many of the workloads in the cloud, in the data center, in colos, and at the edge. Ultimately, AI spans from training and tuning your fundamental models to inferencing, which is where your business transformation takes place and where outcomes are actually delivered. Being hybrid at scale across distributed enterprises is complex and difficult to deploy and manage. And as a result, many enterprises like you here in the room have become hybrid by accident. This is why we introduced our HP GreenLake Cloud Platform with the vision to help you become hybrid by design with a unified experience. And finally, we declared that we were entering the age of insights where your data was the, so valuable that one day will be recorded as an asset in your balance sheet. But the reality is many organizations are data rich and insight poor. And massive amounts of data remain trapped in silos and distributed across the entire enterprise. And dealing with the many data challenges remain a top issue. I hear from many of you, I spend more than 50% of my time talking to customers and partners and they tell us they hold you back from moving forward faster with your business transformation. And solving those challenges is our top priority, so you can advance into the next phase of this new age of insights. For decades, AI has been on a, seen as a promise on the horizon. In November 2022, that promise became mainstream with the release of the, what we call the first language, language model, uh, called ChatGPT. And you know what? It wasn't just a milestone. It was a massive shift that shook the foundation of what we believe would be possible. It opened a new world of possibilities to accelerate business transformation across every industry. We see generative AI as the most complex data-intensive workload. It creates unique and unprecedented demands on IT and actually the business itself introducing new challenges that most of you had never encountered before. 
And simply put, what worked uh, yesterday won't work tomorrow. You must shift your approach to be successful. So what really takes? First, generative AI is, the most, is way more demanding on infrastructure. It requires way more uh, computational power because it's processed large amount of distributed data and it has to train and learn constantly, which is very different what normally software does, which is to follow a set of routines. You need supercomputing power with a network architecture for AI at scale, as well as specialized storage capabilities in a data pipeline in order to process this amount, which is very large, of distributed data. With generative AI, the pace of change is also much, much faster. Foundational models constantly learn, meaning they must train and be tuned regularly to remain accurate and current. And deploying AI is not just about following the user rules of data compliance and governance. The implementation of your, your AI strategy must consider many, many aspects, including security, data privacy and compliance, cost, ethics, and very, very importantly, the impact on the carbon footprint that has in your enterprise. Lastly, deploying generative AI uh, into your business process is very, very difficult and requires adjusting your operating model and training your team on how to use it very effectively. According to, uh, to a May 2023 study by Accenture, 73% of enterprises are prioritizing AI above all other digital investments but 89% need help scaling models into production. These stats tell us that being successful is not easy and requires the right approach and the right partner. And to support our customers on their AI journey, HP is developing an AI native architecture strategy that's simple to deploy and consume. And today, we will announce several new AI native offerings. HP will deliver an AI native architecture through our HP GreenLake Cloud platform as the unified experience. An AI native architecture begins with creating a data-first pipeline that feeds the data from all data sources that your model requires. It provides unique software infrastructure and services to process, train, tune, and deploy your models. Finally, our AI native architecture is hybrid by design, with sustainability as a priority at every level. And that's why sustainability has been core to our HP GreenLake strategy and honestly differentiates our solution from others. And recently, HP was ranked amongst the top 10 sustainable cloud companies in the world by Sustainability Magazine. Ultimately, our AI native strategy is designed to accelerate your business transformation. Myself, my team engage with many customers who share. They are all at the different stages of the AI life cycle. Some of you are developing and training models. Others of you will be leveraging existing models and privately fine-tune them with your data to eventually deploy it across your enterprise. HP covers all stages of the AI life cycle and brings the unique technology and expertise you need. We have decades of experience as the global leader in supercomputing, which is an essential component for developing and training generative AI models, including large language models. Every week, new large language models are coming to market, creating massive demand for supercomputing capacity. And believe it or not, since the beginning of 2023, the AI market has exploded. In fact, I just announced our earnings, and I share that since the beginning of this calendar year, HPE has experienced a 250% growth in AI orders in that just nine months time frame. It's just unbelievable. So the question is, how are we gonna meet that demand? And that's why at HP Discover Las Vegas in June this year, we announced our vision for an AI native cloud and a lighthouse foundational model called HP GreenLake for large language models in partnership with leading AI model developer, which is a European company called Aleph Alpha, 
which will be available in the first half of 2024. And now, I would like to introduce you to one of the leading AI cloud providers who is helping modern developers bring AI to life. Tiger Cloud, a northern data company, is Europe's first and largest dedicated generative AI cloud service provider. Here to share more is Tiger Cloud Managing Director, Carl Harvard. Please welcome Carl. Welcome, welcome to Barcelona. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to talk about AI and cloud. But perhaps, maybe we should start by sharing with the audience who is Taiga, what you do, and, uh, and why you're so excited about this moment in time with AI. Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks ever so much for inviting me to join you in the keynote. And um, it means a lot to us and, and Taiga to get this level of, of visibility. And um, to answer your question, I mean, why we're excited, and people do say on stages such as Liz, they're, they're excited, but genuinely excited about this moment in time that we find ourselves. And that is, um, you know, I don't think, and this is someone with a grey beard, um, I can recall a time when uh, technology and the creative human um, capability have come together to sort of set the world alight with all sorts of optimism and what if possibilities. And um, of course, in order for generative AI specifically to help create new products and services, we need to build an ecosystem to help them to do that. And um, the second party question, to, to answer what, what Tiger Cloud is, we're, I think you said it actually, we're, we're Europe's first and largest and cleanest generative AI cloud service provider and now an elite partner with NVIDIA too. So um, excited to be a key player, hopefully, in Europe, in, in the industry, and um, help organizations of all types, startups, enterprises, to bring their best ideas to life. And that's, that, that's, that's the, the service that we want to provide, the European and also the global, the global market. Um, and the other thing is, with size comes responsibility. Exactly. And, and, and therefore, um, I think we have a duty, if we're offering this, this compute capability, uh, we have a duty to make sure people can ha access it. So one of our values is democratizing access to this, this great technology. And what that means is, um, as an infra infrastructure as a service provider, we're not going to sell all our compute capacity to one customer for three years. We actually want to make sure that startups of all sorts, enterprises of all sorts, can actually have access to um, a compliant, a clean cloud and be able to bring their, their best ideas to life. So. Yeah, no, that's a very important point, Carl, because you know, we think about technologies like AI. I actually think not different than connectivity at the time. It's how we make it accessible to all. Otherwise, we're going to create, you know, uh, separations in the society, and that clearly is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So, when you think about um, the work you do, right? Maybe you can share a little bit more. What type of customers you support? What type of work they do, uh, yeah. and so forth. We, we're seeing a whole mix of, of, of different customers. Um, but one I'd like to reference is a company called Poolside. I don't know whether you're familiar with Poolside. Um, they're actually a team that have come out of GitHub. They've set up in France, so a great European organization. And their whole um, reason for being is to democratize software development. So to allow people to develop software using generative AI that no, not necessarily, like me, don't know how to code. And um, yeah, I'm really delighted that they've been selected us on our platform. We can help them hopefully achieve their, their goals and dreams and be part of that. So Carl, obviously, we have lived in a cloud-native world for a long time. Um, but perhaps you can talk a little about what is different this time that required a different architecture for what you're doing. And, you know, and why not a hyperscaler, a hyperscaler as a potential end, end destination? Yeah, so, um, so what we have done, and uh, you know, 
with our recent investment with HP of 330 million euros. That's additional to what we've invested so previously. So so much is spent with us. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, um, together, I mean, not just not just the the, the value of the order, but the, but the, the the value of the the partnership. I think we we have together allows us to develop a true fit for purpose cloud service provide, well, provision for generative AI. And what I mean by that is we've worked hard together to configure what will be now 20,000 plus GPUs. We're rolling out the H100 islands um, from the end of this year into 2024. But we've configured them in the right way from an engineering point of view. So for those who are probably more technical than me in the audience, we've got um, built islands together at over 2,000 GPUs each. Um, Bluefield DPU managed with 3.2 terabit uh, InfiniBand connectivity, and, and that's a replicable model we'll, we'll locate across our various data centers. So as well as the engineering aspect being fit for purpose, it's also how we want to power and cool them. So we're locating them in our data centers in the north of Europe, and we'll be extending that footprint where um, well, they're totally renewably energy driven. So hydro uh, driven, even in a disused mine under, under the sea, not under the sea, below sea level, should I say, um, which does the natural cooling for the, for the environment as well. So as well as having the, the clean renewable energy, also the way we use that energy is um, very efficient. So our PUEs will always be 1.2 or below. Our infrastructure in Sweden is 1.06 as a PUE, if that means anything. And in Norway and Leftel, it's 1.15. So, I think there needs to be an understanding that, and your question about the hyperscalers is, is interesting. I think it's, we're now offering an alternative. So the de facto has been, let's go uh, to the public cloud providers, I'll sign up and I'll use my generative AI compute power there. However, with our Northern Data Group investment as a total now up to 800 million, um, we believe we're now a serious alternative, certainly inside Europe to, to um, Give organizations another option, put it, put it, put it that way. Uh, and the other key thing I'd like to add to that is we've invested heavily also in compliance. So we have a dedicated legal counsel. Um, and if you're a startup, if you're an enterprise moving into generative AI, then what's interesting is compliance may not be at the forefront of mind. So we're going to help these people uh, and organizations be compliant as they, as they then grow. Maybe the last question for you, Carl. Um, and I'm sure the audience will follow up with you offline, but why you were attracted to HP? What, what attracted to you uh, to HP? It's a great question. I mean, it's, I think you offer true diversity of, of technology. Um, you share the same values that we have around sustainability, the democratization of access. Um, you've got very talented people in the organization. Um, and you're great to work with. I mean, that, that's, that's the other thing, which you, you know, it's really, really good uh, collaborative ways of working that we've, uh, we've experienced to date, and long may that continue. Well, thank you, Carl. As always said, we are as good as the technology and the people we bring in front of customers. And one thing I'm really proud of what we do is our culture and our people and our talent. So for me, it's, 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 it's always proud to be with uh, customers like you, which are you know, pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And we're looking forward to what comes next. Because it's exciting times. Yeah. Right? And by the way, can I just do one plug? Yeah. Um, booth 1024, if you want to talk 10, to us. 1024. We're, we're outside. Okay, there. great. Interesting number, 1024. 24. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Let's give it a round of applause for Carl and Tiger. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carl, for the partnership. Building training models is a key part of our AI life cycle. But most enterprises and most of you here in the audience today want to leverage existing models because you don't have the capability to build these models and privately fine tune them with your own data to enable your own unique business use cases. Our goal is to enable your organization to leverage the right mix of data, foundation models, tools, and AI native infrastructure to rapidly train, tune, and deploy your models to transform your business. And to help you to be successful, HP GreenLake Cloud Platform unifies the speed and agility of a cloud-native world approach with the performance, flexibility, and scale you need of an AI-native architecture. 
Partnerships are also a critical component of delivering full stack solutions across the entire AI lifecycle. HP and NVIDIA have a history of collaboration to deliver innovative supercomputing and AI solutions. And today, we continue to advance our HP AI strategy with NVIDIA. By bringing together HP and NVIDIA software infrastructure and services into one integrated solution delivered through our HP GreenLake Cloud platform with speed, time to value for you. I would like to bring now my next guest in a moment. But first, let's watch a quick video, which is actually a funny video. Welcome in. I hope you're hungry. Here to talk more about how HP and NVIDIA have come together to help businesses unlock the power of AI is Vice President of Enterprise Computing at NVIDIA, Manu Virdas. Ah, you show up. Yeah. <laughs> so now I understand why Jens is not here. Is it somewhere in space? He's in space. OK, yeah. great. Awesome. <laughs> So welcome to Barcelona, Manuel. Thank you. We it's really great to be appreciate here. you making the time to be with us today. You know, I just talked about the long history HP and NVIDIA have for decades, driving amazing innovation, yeah. achieving some of the greatest breakthroughs, uh, and have partnered together to, you know, to deliver technology solutions up and down the stack. You know, earlier this month, we were at the Supercomputer 2023 conference. That's right. At uh, Denver, Colorado. And we jointly announced a new turnkey generative AI solution for training, uh, which was going to be built now on HP supercomputer technology. And this solution is for training and tuning generative AI for large enterprises, research institutions, and government, obviously, organizations. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about what was that announcement all about, yeah. how it came together, and what value will deliver to our customers. Yeah. I mean, firstly, I, I want to start, Antonio, by saying, as you said, we have been working together for many years, right? Um, and what's interesting is that the journey we had been on together was that there were some companies that had got to the point of understanding that there's an AI use case that matters to them. You know, whatever industry they're yeah. in, uh, they'd find a business case and they would be willing to make the investment to set up an AI infrastructure, a data science team, all of that for themselves. And we'd work together to deliver them this new HPC supercomputing style solution, right? And we would do that sort of one organization at a time, one customer at a time. And then the world just changed completely a year ago, Overnight. right? As you said. Overnight. And what happened was, I think the simplest way to think about it was that we now finally have this universal use case of AI, right? Which is no matter what industry you're in, or what job function you're in, there's a way that AI can actually help you, that generative AI can help you. And so what's happened, what we've seen together with you is that the number of companies that have been coming to us saying, we need to set up our own infrastructure to build our own models has just increased dramatically, right? And so when that happens, you cannot DIY this thing anymore. You know, no. you can't just hack it up. You need a proper solution. You need the right infrastructure. You need the right software. You need the know-how. You need the help, right? And so the thing that uh, we announced together uh, that's, uh, that's here from Supercomputing was for that set of companies, you know, the hundreds to thousands of companies and organizations that are in the business of building their own large language models now, how can we give them a turnkey solution with the infrastructure, the software, and all of that? Um, and so that's very exciting, right? And uh, as you mentioned, we're seeing a lot of success with that. And the whole point, it was not just the technology, it's the simplicity of deploying and consuming it. Because as you said, you know, these are very complex systems. Yeah. And the, and the issue customers have is they don't have the time to bring all the widgets together and make it work. We can get them a turnkey solution that works out of the box. Now, but that's not good enough. That's not good enough. So the question is how we advance this further. And so today, 
we are going to advance our strategic collaboration by announcing a new generative AI full solution that's, again, co-engineered, but is very specifically targeting enterprises. And for them, it's all about fine-tuning models. They are not the model builders, as we call it, right. but are the more the model deployers uh, in the, across the enterprise, because ultimately the business transformation happens through the inferencing of the model with the data. Right. So, can you talk about what we're going to announce yeah, today? I'm so excited about this yeah. solution, you know. It's uh, really fantastic, because I think the way, uh, the way we think about it, Antonio, and, and what we're seeing in NVIDIA is, there's really three kinds of customers or enterprise companies uh, in this generative AI journey, right? So we just talked about sort of what I would say is the smallest set, which is I'm going in the business of building my own models, right? And training my own foundation models. I need that kind of supercomputing infrastructure. You can think of it as a factory, like an AI factory. You think about your traditional factories, what are you doing? You're taking raw materials in and to your factory and you're producing products, right? But the new factory is the AI factory where you're taking in data. You know, you talked yeah. about how important data is all the work you're doing. And that's why the data first pipeline that's is so That's why the data important. first pipeline, right, exactly. So that's fantastic. So you're bringing your data in and then you're turning it into intelligence. So the input is your data and your output is intelligence, human intelligence, right? And it's coded up in these large language models, right? So the first solution we talked about was for the companies that are really in the business, the hundreds to thousands of companies, who are producing their own models, uh, and they need these factories. Uh, then you have on the other end, you have pretty much, you're going to see every company adopt some piece of software from a large software vendor where the software has been enhanced by generative AI, right? And so in that case, the customer is not directly learning how to do AI. They're just using AI because the next version of the product that they use you know, and their finance team or their sales organization has been infused with AI, right? So now what we're talking about here with the new solution today is for those, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of enterprise companies that sit right in the middle. And the middle, as you said, is... Well, the, by the way, most of them are here. Most of them are here, right? And this middle is, this is where the democratization of AI happens because, you know, I come from a company that has worked on AI for many years, right? And I will tell you, AI is hard. And it's hard because creating a model, finding all the data, curating the data, all the infrastructure, the data science team to build a model is not easy to do. What's fundamentally changed in generative AI is that you have these foundation models that somebody else has already done the work to train up for you, and you can start from that. But yet, as an enterprise company, if I start with a foundation model, and then I fine tune it with my own data, and if I have a platform that allows me to then take that model with me, to put it in my briefcase and take it with me, it belongs to me. So somebody else did 99% of the work, but yet somehow I can do the remaining 1% of the work, and now it becomes mine. Right. And, and why, that's why many customers here right, are going to be in the middle. They want to leverage some of these foundation models, which are all already pre-trained, if you will, but then tune it to their, their own use case using their data. And that's one of the biggest challenges, because I can tell you when I talk to customers like here in the room, they don't want to put the data in the public right. domain. That's your intellectual property. What they want is bring the model to the data and do it in a private, secure, and safe way. And that's what this solution will allow that's customers right. to do. Ultimately, as I think about this, is time to value. Time to value how you get uh, access to this technology that allows you to move at the speed that your business requires. Because if you're not adopting this technology, you're going to be left behind. We have a say in the company, the future belongs to the fast. And yeah. this is an example of doing something fast agree. that eventually delivers yeah, business in, results. In fact, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, great, uh, uh, a great moment to talk about what is actually going to happen with this technology in the enterprise, right? So who is the new enterprise application developer. Because we know for years, uh, there's been, you know, in any large company, there are hundreds or thousands of in-house applications that people build, like you look at, at a big bank, right? And your classical enterprise application developer, as so many of you uh, here know, is working with data warehouses, databases, writing SQL queries, a little bit of code around that, and then you've got all these different little applications in your company. So really what generative AI is doing is creating the next wave of such applications where instead of doing a SQL query to your data warehouse, you take 
any employee in your company, right, whatever job function they might be, let's say you're in uh, PR, right, and you're writing the next press release, uh, you want to be able to write that press release on the basis of the press releases you wrote for the last right. year, right? That's a natural thing. And so you need a little generative AI assistant that will do that for you. So how does the developer build one of these things? What you do is uh, you have these things called embedding models. You, you extract the data from your enterprise data warehouse, wherever that, that information is stored. You create embeddings. You put them in a vector database. Then you ask the question to the assistant. The assistant converts your question into an embedding. It goes into the same vector database. You do a search. You find the best fit answers. You feed it back to a large language model, and you get a beautifully curated answer. That's what one of these modern applications looks like. Now, if you think about a typical company, you're going to have teams all around your company building hundreds of these applications and different teams in the company. So what does this say to you? You need one platform. Right? right. What you need your IT team to do is deploy one platform that all the people around the company can do this work on. And that's what's so exciting about the thing that we've just announced together, because the thing you all did, Antonio, which is so great, is you've not just built awesome servers, but you've built a software stack for AI, right? That's right. With your and you can see here a lot of our software is right? HP software that we bring it together with Nemo and other right. solutions. And, and you know, what we've been doing at NVIDIA is we've built this platform called Nemo that has all the software for these different uh, parts of the process. And so we brought all of that together into one solution. Of course, you've got GreenLake, which is a great way for people to consume it as well. So I think it all sort of just yeah. comes together. You know, I just did my uh, 24th earnings announcement. Believe it or not, time has flown. And, uh, this is a little secret. I use AI and then spit my earnings uh, script, and the stock is up 8%. <laughs> uh, that's, the next, that's the way I'm going to do it the next quarter. <laughs> so I can get ahead of the game against the analysts so they can understand how we're changing the narrative here. But uh, jokes aside, you know, this is not the only thing we're doing. So we have another exciting news, which is uh, we are announcing HP GreenLake Flex Solution for the digital twin. Obviously, creating a digital twin of everything is, is exploding, right? About simulation using generative and, and, and so forth. So this solution actually brings together the NVIDIA Omniverse, which is a phenomenal piece of software. And I saw some of the work you guys have done uh, when we were there with you and Jensen. Our HP ProLion, which is the best hybrid compute platform ever built in the history uh, of infrastructure, and our, our leading HP Electra storage portfolio that gives the ability to enterprises to design, simulate, and provide customers with the ability to optimize assets and processes across the enterprise. So can you talk a little bit more about this new digital twin solution? Yeah, this is so exciting for us, Antonio, because we're all very focused on generative AI, uh, of course. But Omniverse is a big, big uh, effort from NVIDIA because, as you said, there's a physical world all these companies and industries that are in the business of producing physical things that we all use every day. But this is a very expensive thing to do. And the promise of digitization and the confluence of, of AI is that you can do all this work digitally. You can design your products digitally. You can design the factories in which you build your products digitally. Uh, you can experience all of that. And then you can try so many different combinations, variations, and when you're ready, then you press go and you do it in the physical world, right? And so Omniverse is the platform that enables all of that. But again, this is new technology, right? And so it has to be consumed in the right way. And so you need the right infrastructure with the right servers. You need actually a lot of help from services to help people put it services all together. Is key. It's key here, right? I think it's really key. And so that's what we're excited to be working with you on, right? So it's, whether it's the simulation of the physical goods, whether it's the simulation of the factories, and finally, it's you know, a lot of testing that it's, takes place. It's too. testing, right? I mean, think about autonomous vehicles. You have to try out all the combinations you can before you put something on the road, and it's much, much more efficient to do that digitally. But all of them need supercomputer power at some point. They all require that power. Yeah. And, and you know, the most beautiful thing, Antonio, is these sound like two different things, right? Generative AI, large language models, and an omniverse. But it all comes together. I'll give you a simple example. Okay, imagine just as a human that you're designing your living room, right? And what would be more awesome than saying, textually, how about a couch that is like this? And you just generate a 3D object for that couch, and then you place it in your virtual living room, you move things around until you feel like you've got a good-looking living room, and then you hit go, right? 
And that's exactly what we can now do because with the generative AI, we can produce these models in the right format. They can go into Omniverse. So with you, we've got the end-to-end -end yeah. solution. Right? Yeah. Well, thank you, Manavir. I mean, I think, you know, we just went through almost 50 minutes of chat. We can go forever. But what really makes me proud is the work we do as, as companies. The partnership we have for decades has been proven over and over and over. And again today, we are proving again that we're bringing unique breakthrough innovation that ultimately speeds up time to value for you. It removes the barriers of adopt these amazing technologies and be able to consume it the way you want it with one unified experience, which we're all building through our HP GreenLake cloud platform. And I'm honestly excited what comes next because yeah. Manuvir, myself, my team here in the front row and Jensen meet every few weeks. This is how fast this is going. And so I'm sure in, in few weeks we will be making further announcements and stay tuned for those. So with that, thank you very much, Manuri. Make sure that uh, tell Jesse to come down to her. Right. Thank right. you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so building on our announcements with NVIDIA today, I'm also excited to announce several new HP GreenLake solutions. One of the biggest bottlenecks to effectively train and tune foundational models is applying large traditional storage solutions to unique data demands of AI workloads. We said at the beginning, these AI workloads are very data intensive. They have completely different characteristics. And so today, I'm very pleased to announce we have made significant performance enhancement within HP GreenLake for file storage to address the density and throughput demands for AI workloads engineered to provide high-performance file storage for AI. HP GreenLake for file storage is optimized to keep pace with large-scale AI workloads. And with our common enhancements available early the first half of next year, we will increase the capacity density and throughput by seven times. Many of you tell us you want to properly train and tune AI foundational models with your data. Today, we're also announcing a new HP GreenLake Flex solution that includes GPU-based HP ProLiant compute with HP GreenLake for file storage. Think of this as an AI-optimized private cloud. These solutions also integrate Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault software to protect AI models and data sources, and HP Now Ops Ramp software to provide observability and automation. Navigate and AI also require a trusted partner who understands the technology and has the expertise and the financial support to help you design, implement, and manage your solutions sustainably. And today, we are announcing new HP services for AI, which offer a broad portfolio of consulting services, workforce training, and deployment solutions to support you on every step of your journey. And I'm proud of that work because we work together with many partners who are here in the room who are also invest in, in services for you. Additionally, HP Financial Services combines technology insights, financial expertise, and deep-rooted focus on sustainability to create smarter IT life cycles for customers and partners of all sizes. As you can see, today's announcements dramatically simplify and accelerate the adoption of AI enter for enterprises of all sizes. Now, I would like to introduce to you three game-changing HP customers who, like many of you, are on their unique journey, that transformation journey we all aspire with both hybrid cloud and AI. So please join me in welcoming Joanna Rafael, CEO of Sensei, an innovative company at the forefront of leveraging computer vision to transform the retail experience across Europe. Andreas Kranebittel, uh, CIO of SPAR ICS, SPAR Austria's innovation engine, which oversees IT operations in eight countries across Central Europe. And Dr. Hamed, um, also highly, group head of technology of, at the Red Sea Global, a company is taking the luxury travel business to the next level in Saudi Arabia. He showed me some pictures earlier. It's phenomenal. So welcome to all. Hello, Joanna. Welcome. Thank you. Andreas. Hey, Antonio. Hello. Hello. 
Dr. Ahmed. Please, take a seat. Welcome, welcome to HP Discover. Uh, it's really glad to, be, to, to have you here to tell your story. Because I always said, you know, we can be here and talk all day long about what HP does, but I think the best way to tell the story is from a customer in point of view. What we do for you and ultimately what enables you to do. And I think each of you represents an enterprise of the future. You know, it can be age-centric, as we're going to talk to Dr. Ahmed, cloud-enabled, uh, as uh, Andreas is doing and preparing for the next wave uh, for SPAR, and with Joanna, which obviously is in the forefront of a data-driven, insight-driven kind of journey. Uh, but you all going through the same challenge to become more AI native because you create all amount, a huge amount of data. So maybe we start there, Joanna, with you. Tell us a little bit about Sensei, including how AI is playing a role in your ecosystem. And you are doing something very special, unique. Hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to share the integration of Sensei computer vision technology with HP computing in our autonomous stores. And thank you, Antonio, for the opportunity to share our successful collaboration here. AI is actually at the core of everything that we do at Sensei and the backbone for autonomous stores. Actually, at our company, we are on a mission to redefine retail, to remove all the friction from existing stores, and turn them autonomous and checkout free. And we're actually creating a seamless customer shopping experience for the shoppers, but also a much more efficiently digitized store operations for retailers. But you might wonder, how does this technology work, right? Exactly. <laughs> So we have developed um, the most advanced computer vision algorithms that are tailored for retail. And at the store level, we deploy an array of ceiling cameras and sensors on the shelves to make sure that we can detect every product that the customer picks up from the shelf, and we add it automatically to the shopping virtual basket. And if the shopper changes his mind and puts it back on the shelf, we put it back in the store inventory that is actually being monitored in real time. And all of this, of course, needs powerful computing. And we do the processing on the premises where we deploy a micro data center with HP servers and also powered by NVIDIA GPUs. That's great. Um, I think you have a potential customer next to you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are matchmakers, so that we create a vibrant ecosystem here. So maybe that's a good segue to talk about SPAR. Maybe you can talk about SPAR for a little bit and the journey around, Andreas. And, you know, I see the little tree everywhere. So that's a, that's a, that's a great thing. So tell us about SPAR and what you're doing. Yeah, I think SPAR, as you said before, is a very innovative uh, company in the central of Europe. So we are dealing heavily with, or mainly with, with food, but also with uh, um, shopping centers and also a little bit with sports and fashion. But the focus area is, of course, uh, food retail in the center of Europe, and we are trying to become more and more one of the best retailers in, retailers in, in Europe. Yeah. yeah. And, but you are using now yeah, I, like I, the cloud, so how are you deploying that? So AI is really impacting retail day by day, heavily, more and more. And uh, we started very early, so we are, as you said, the innovation engine of SPA. So I think five years ago, we established a team inside SPA dealing with AI technology first, then moving much more closer to the business, finding out where could be business cases, business value. And I think three years ago, we entered the project inside SPA, a very, I think it was one of the first priority projects. And the, the goal was to improve the value chain for, food, uh, for fruits and vegetables. So really to uh, bring fruit and vegetables much more earlier to our stores, from the fields to the stores, and in the baskets to the customers. Yeah. And that, I think, we tried out to use AI for the first time, really for business cases. So in the first moment, there were a lot of doubts if this can work, so also from the top management. Uh, but at the end, so we really delivered with various uh, technologies using AI for forecasting to predict and to ensure that we have the right products in the right volume at the right time at the right place. And this was also impacting or supporting to reduce food waste. Exactly. And, at the end, and at the end of the, of the game now, we can say that we were able to reduce food waste in our company with this process by 20%, not only with AI, but from the, from the general flu. And this is 
this is super great. And Antonio, you have to know that last Monday in Brussels, we got, or we had the honor to got the European Digital Commerce Award for that. Ah, because congratulations. We are, we are there with, we are there supporting uh, uh, to reduce food, food waste, supporting sustainability by using AI and also, and I'm very proud to have the right people to deal with that. Yeah, so really in high impact on retail. Well, think about it now, what AI could do here. In fact, uh, several months ago, I was on a, on, in a car going to the hotel in New York and you know, you have these bus stations, right? Um, across the, 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 the city. And I see an ad that says, uh, every day 800 million people go without food. Think about reducing waste and be able to feed 800 million people instead of throwing the food away, right? Now, all of that starts with connectivity, which I think is a great segue to Dr. Ahmed. You're building an amazing, you know, based on an amazing vision about entertainment and luxury travel, and you're building the fabric of this connectivity. But maybe perhaps you can talk a little bit more about Red Sea Global. What is your mission, what is your vision, and how you're using technology for that? Thank you. So Red Sea Global is uh, one of the world's most ambitious developers. Uh, currently, we're developing the west coast of Saudi Arabia around the Red Sea, and we want you, you, <laughs> you, and everyone in this room to come and visit us. And to convince you to do that... Is there a discount for... for, uh, for... Uh, <laughs> reciprocate. We're going to okay, reciprocate good. discount. <laughs> um, and we have four reasons to convince you to come and visit us. The first one is the Red Sea itself. If you're into diving, snorkeling, any kind of water activities, the Red Sea will be high on your list to visit because it has hundreds of species, marine life, corals that don't exist anywhere else in the world. Second reason is environmental. The only place in the world where you can have a zero carbon vacation is at the Red Sea destination. We are live today with 100% renewable energy. We have our own grid, the world's largest zero carbon grid, the world's largest battery storage system at one gigawatt hour, 780,000 solar panels powering our destination today. So if you care about the environment, that's something that will make us high on your list to visit. Uh, if those two are not enough, I showed you pictures. Yeah. Please go to visitredsea.com, see the astonishing diversity we have. We have desert resorts, we have islands, we even have dormant volcanoes. So much diversity to visit, and really, seeing is believing. You gotta see it to believe that it's worth, worth visiting. Um, the fourth ace we have is your experience when you visit us. Do you have Wi-Fi? It's, Wi-Fi is central to achieving this. Okay, so good. imagine when you land at our airport, it's gonna, it, it's not, you're not gonna recognize this as an airport. It's our welcome center. There's no luggage carousel. Why? Because we've integrated with all the hotels so that we take care of your luggage. So none of the find the luggage, pick up the luggage, oops, wrong luggage, find the luggage, pick up the luggage, drag the luggage, drop the luggage, those 45 minutes of agony have been removed from your experience. Vice versa, when you check out of your hotel, front desk will be like, we'll take care of this for you. When you're out for a ride, you're not gonna wait for more than two, three minutes. Those are just two of 18 smart services working together in the background, invisible, to make your experience when you visit us. But to do that, you need a lot of technology. And all of this requires connectivity. So many different systems that have to be integrated, that have to be connected with the sensors, with the workers, all of this working together to create a memorable experience for you. That's amazing. Well, I'm looking forward to come at some point, but I think you are a great example of what I call an edge-centric use case, which ultimately is leveraging technology like connectivity as the fabric, uh, as uh, being able to build these new experiences and then use technology like hybrid cloud and AI for uh, you know, delivering the services that you're looking for. So maybe go back to uh, Andreas here for a second. You know, as you prepare to the next phase, you have to build this foundation, right? This foundation of creating a hybrid cloud by design strategy and ultimately prepare the data for what comes next. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that journey, how that worked for you and where you are in that journey and why, honestly, you have uh, selected HP Green Lake. The why is very easy. So if you look at the retail business, so there is a lot of technology. So I think 
starting at the payment machine at the checkout, so going, so there's a lot of technology digital in the stores, then have a look on the supply chain, a lot of automation is there, also in the warehouses and so on, and, and of course also back office, and then more and more we are also touching the workforce to give them technology in their hand. And there are systems and applications, they have to be very close to the business, very close to the warehouse, very close to the stores, uh, very close to, the, to our production plant. And I think this is the data center planet. So here we are using our data centers because we are using high specific applications to really support this, this heavy business, very fast moving business. So here is our efficiency and here is also our, I think, uh, our USB on the, on the market. And then if you look on the backbone, we have analytics, ERP, I think this is more and more going into the cloud planet, let me say. And if you think then digital to the customer, of course, this is heavily cloud, so talking about e-commerce, and also bringing digital tools really in front or in the hands of the customer. Also here we have a super project from my point of view. In August we launched in Austria a very cool app for the customer. And this is, from my technology for you, really a lighthouse project because we are really combining cloud functionality in front of the customer and using data center functionality to bring all our functions, all our user experience to the stores and uh, to, the, to the customer. So I think this is really a big story where we can see that both planets are necessary and are helping us to bring this business value. Why you selected HP Green Lake? What attracted you to the value proposition of it? Antonio, this is a very easy question. So you have to know that I'm collaborating with H HP uh, since the early 1990s, so I'm dealing Thank with... Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I really remember the day when we decided because we, we moved from main, uh, mainframe to the, to the open world and decided to go, to go with, with HP and this was really a yeah, very successful journey on that. And because there is an ongoing uh, work on the, on the strategy, so it's really a long-term strategy and I think the, the teams, so your teams, especially the team in Austria, sometimes supported from Germany, and your personal support. I think this gave us the guarantee that we are on the right stage and the technology is really outstanding, so we are very sure that we will improve and continue this partnership the next five years. Maybe then is a change of the CIO of SPA, we will see, but I will hand over you in good With hands. With technology, your role changed. I mean, I'm sure, you know, based on the experience, you see how your role keeps evolving. It's not just running IT, but it's innovating on IT as you go forward. Our role is to bring the simplicity and the capability so you keep advancing the business outcomes that SPAR is looking for, which is not just revenue growth, but is to, you know, grow the footprint, is, is provide better experience in the store, reduce the waste, and ultimately digitize the entire business. Which brings me back to you, Joanna, because as you can hear, whether it's Red Sea uh, or SPAR, they're all automating, digitizing these experiences, and it creates an enormous amount of data. So maybe you can talk about uh, the incredible amount of data that generate, how the experience of customer comes to life. So how do you think that's going to play in the solution you, you're working on? Yeah, so actually in a Sensei-powered store, in an autonomous store, we have imagined and designed what we thought would be the most convenient and more frictionless shopping experience. In a store like this, a customer, they walk in, they grab the products they like, as they always did in any supermarket, and then when they are ready, they just leave the store. And what happens is that they will be automatically charged on their credit card that is already registered in a mobile app after they leave the store. And actually, in a store like this, you have no lines, you have no checkouts, no hassle, no scanning. That's great. It's really the, the best shopping experience that you, you can have. And it seems like going to your fridge at home or your pantry at home because it's really seamless and simple. But actually, we're not just creating stores. So in the past years, we've been uh, privileged to be able to write with our retail customers um, a bit of the history of the retail industry. And we are very proud to have the strong support of HP Portugal, who I want to thank also in the role of Carlos Light, who supported our journey since. Carlos is session. very passionate about things. <laughs> He's fantastic. And actually, we have been pioneering opening the first ever autonomous store in continental Europe and Latin America um, a couple of years ago. And more recently, actually, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we have deployed a store in Italy. Actually, 
helps us to continue to push the boundaries. If you make a walk in Italy, it works everywhere, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a fantastic store, actually, that one. It's with the Conad brand, with the oh, Dow Cooperative. Yeah. And actually, uh, in this store, we actually push the boundaries of what the technology was capable until that moment. And there, we have designed a shopping experience that is even more convenient than what I described to you before because literally allows anyone, regardless of age or technological familiarity, to use the store. Because in this store, you actually don't need to download any app, and you have absolutely no barriers to enter the store. So everyone comes in to the store, as they always did in any normal supermarkets. And actually, when the customer is ready to leave and has his shopping already with him, he just arrives to the exit of the store and finds in a, in a screen a payment terminal uh, the basket in front of him in real time as he approaches the screen. So this allows them to confirm the basket, to have the comfort of seeing the expenses before they leave, and to choose to pay by card or by cash before the exit. And actually for us, you know, this is actually what we imagined it would be the best and more inclusive shopping experience, where you are providing uh, technology like artificial intelligence for literally everyone. And this is actually right at the backbone, at the answers of our vision at Sensei. Yeah. We wanted to create what is the most seamless, frictionless shopping experience for customers, and also, of course, providing this big array in the but amount of data. You can take even data. further, because you think Sorry, about it, right? So if you have some sort of predefined list and use connectivity to guide with your location services where the food is, and then, you know, gets then the second part of this journey you just described, then actually you're taking a, a step even further, not just in the store, but before you go to the store, um, in, in order to even provide a much more delightful efficient. So there's something to think about it. Maybe you and, and, and Andreas can work that. So back to you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, obviously, you're building something amazing, uh, and you're building the first step, which is the connectivity layer, to be able to provide these amazing experiences. As I think about the next phase of that journey, how, how technology is going to play a role? What type of services you're looking for? What type of technologies you will be deploying as you go forward? So you're probably not going to like this a lot, but we are not a technology company. So we're never going to do technology just for the sake of doing technology. Any tech we uh, introduce, it's either making lives better, making us more efficient, or has an environmental impact. Uh, but if you look at it from the other side, that's a lot of tech to make it happen. So um, take the example of Shura Island that we're going to be introducing next year. It's going to have 11 hotels, 18-hole um, golf course, a water sports center, uh, lots of cool stuff. But what's interesting in that is the full integration between all of these assets. Imagine staying at a Hyatt Hotel, going for a coffee at the Four Seasons, getting a treatment at the Intercontinental, and then going to um, the water sports center doing some golf, all of this, just tapping on your phone as you go, charging it back to your room. So when you come to my destination, if you're staying to, for a week, you get that free voucher and you just roam freely and enjoy it to your preferences. All of this, you barely hear any technology in it, but making it happen, Behind the you need that full stack and you need that universal connectivity everywhere for that to work. Why you selected HP Aruba Networking? Well, if in the hospitality industry, Aruba is the golden standard. And even beyond hospitality, if you look at you know, Gartner reports, so on and so forth, we all know who ranks number one there. Um, it's critical for me to have the best technology. Um, it's critical for me to streamline it, so we're standardizing it across all the assets. And then you get all that added value of the additional features from Passpoint, analytics, all that AI that goes into place. It just gives you that winning formula. I know we can go forever, but I, I will say thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, is, is it kind of interesting when you hear these stories, the different levels of the journey they are on. Some are building these amazing experiences that starts with the connectivity and then building on top. Right. Some already farther along, like you, you are, Andreas, where now you already build the foundation. Now you need to move to the next phase, which is use the data. And some are really in the far, far front now building these breakthrough uh, experience that we have never imagined before, applying these amazing technologies like AI and computer visions and others. 
the takeaway is that HP can offer all of that to you to one integrated, unified experience. And that's called HP GreenLake. Thank you very much for all of you. I'm looking forward to spending time with you and the rest of our customers and partners here in the next couple of days. Thank you for sharing the, the, the story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you heard some amazing stories. You know, all of them require transformational technologies, including like mobility and cloud. And, and, and the reality is, when we think about these transformational technologies, we have been living through some breakthroughs that happens every 10 years or so. But the reality is that with AI, we are moving even faster at the level we had never imagined before. Think about it. Nine months ago, we were not talking about large language models or chat, GPT, and the like. And HP, for more than 80 years, has served as a strategic partner. And Andreas talked about that a little bit uh, through help them through these massive transformations. You know what? I, as an engineer, although I'm no longer an engineer per se, I have better engineers in the front row, uh, I always said that the technical part of this is actually probably the easiest challenge to go solve. That's the reality. Maybe I'm, I'm privileged because I work with such smart people in our headquarters that just walk through the floors and see innovations laying all around. The other day I was working in one of the labs and I saw a server immersed in the water and I could see the lights through the water. I said, wow, who thought that water and electronics would not go together? And, but the reality is the technical part of this is the easiest part. The most difficult problems is how we handle things like data responsibility, ensuring quality, equity. You know, this is an important topic. Privacy, security, and sustainability, which I believe Europe is in the forefront. And this includes solving how we use, you know, we, we solve this ethical, unbiased, and legal use of AI now that's exploding in front of us, as well as creating it with transparency and trust. And for many years, our brightest minds in Hewlett Packard Labs and our CTO community, which are fabulous, amazing people, have worked with customers like you here in the room around the world to solve some of these critical challenges. And that's core to our purpose, our purpose to advance the way we live and work, guide us every single day. Yes, we need to make profit, that's why we are in business. That's why my fiduciary duty to our shareholders is to create value with them. But also solving some of these big societal problems is core to what we do. And one of our many partners on this journey has been a, a, an amazing CEO, a CEO of, uh, for, for Good Tech Advisory, Kay Firth Butterfield. She's a former inaugural head of artificial intelligence and a member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum and one of the world's foremost experts on governance, governance on AI. And I know it's top of mind for you here in the audience. Kay also co-founded the Responsible AI Institute. It was the first, here the first chief AI ethic officer. Please join me in welcoming Kay to discuss this very important topic about ethics in AI. Okay? Hello, Kay. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to HP Discover. You know, we spent probably an hour or so, a little bit more than that, talking about technology, business, use cases. But this is probably one of the most important things we need to discuss today, which is uh, how we use this amazing technology with responsibility, with ethics. And you know, AI is an amazing technology. We see it today. But maybe you can share a little bit more about your background so you can, people can to know you and how you came across to the topic of ethics and AI. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, many years ago, I was a British barrister. We wear the wigs and gowns and go to court. And then somebody said, well, maybe you'd like to be a judge. And I tried it and hated being <laughs> a judge. And so then I needed a new career. Fortunately, um, I was offered a professorship in America. 
went there and started studying the link between artificial intelligence and human beings. And you know, this was back in 2010. You were talking about, we didn't think about generative AI yeah. until last year. So this was very early. But by 2014, um, there were maybe 10 of us thinking about that then. And, so you started um, <laughs> the movement. <laughs> I guess we did. And, and then uh, Steve, Professor Stephen Hawking wrote an article. An amazing individual. But by the way, we helped him and the team provided him at the time supercomputing power oh, to do his research. Brilliant. OK, so he wrote this article with some others um, in the Times of London saying AI might be the best thing that we do. It might be the last thing that humanity does. And so one week later, I was on that long 10-hour journey from uh, London to Austin, Texas, where I was living, so on a plane, sat next to somebody who was the CEO of a startup AI company. And as wow. I say, there were just a few people in the world that he could have sat next to and said, I'm actually really worried about what Stephen Hawkins is saying. And 10 hours later, he offered me a job to go and start what became the world's first ethics advisory panel. And wow. I, we had to come up with a name. So That's awesome. that was me. That's great. <laughs> um, you know, let's talk about where are we? You know, so whether it is the AI Act in the European Union or the new executive order that uh, the, the President of the United States just signed two weeks ago and have the honor to be there during the ceremony because our team uh, provide a lot of input into that executive order. Um, what progress we're making? How far are we? Yes, well, I think, you know, what we're, what we're seeing is that um, the Biden order is really a movement to, so, to escape Congress, because Congress, although there's some You can get nothing done in Congress in the United States these days, I tell you. And so, um, although there are obviously enforceability issues around the, uh, uh, an executive order, I would say that if you're, a, if you're a company that's really thinking about how you're going to move forward with responsibility and compliance, and perhaps you know, wanting to avoid ending up in court about some of these things, then it's a nice roadmap. It's a roadmap to help you think about procurement, because, of course, it helps the American government to think about procurement. And if you add in the NIST um, uh, framework as well, then it's something that sensible companies should be looking to uh, as a guideline. Um, I, in, in Europe, we're seeing the European AI Act, but now it's sort of stumbling a bit because we don't know whether LLMs are going to be yep. included. But I think that one of the things that I would ask you all to take away is that actually, although there's no regulation at the moment around AI, there are existing regulators who are saying, well, we regulate discrimination in hiring, for example, and if you use AI and it's discriminatory, that's what we talk about in bias in AI, then we're going to sue you for doing that yeah. anyway. And, you know, the liability stops with you because you're using it. And we're seeing this whole spate of um, cases, legal cases around IP and copyright and things. Yeah. And so don't be lulled into the idea that actually um, there's nothing going to happen to you if you misuse AI. And then I think if we, if we look at you know, what, what companies should be doing now, companies should be educating the board and the C-suite and their employees, um, and maybe thinking about should you have an ethics advisory board, and if you haven't got principles, creating some principles, and from those principles, really looking at how you put it into By the practice. way, we at HP, we have an ethics advisory board. Some of our leaders here uh, are part of that. It's 
not just how we build AI in our technologies, which is embedded everywhere these days, but also how we use AI inside the company. And in our, you know, when I think about the conversation we have with my board, um, with our directors, one of the things that really popped up very quickly in the last enterprise risk management, which we have to go through on a regular basis, AI shows up as a top risk right now. And that is as the, the framework by which we hold ourselves accountable to tackle these challenges head on. It's not just about geopolitical tension, supply chain disruption, and the like, uh, or talent acquisition. Now AI has made the top of the list. And maybe that's a, another question for you, is that what advice you will have, since you have been spending almost 14 years on this topic and have engaged with multiple companies, multiple government entities, and I do believe that we, the private sector and the public sector, have to come together to solve this challenge. Because you can't rely just on the government to figure out what the policies and should be. But what advice you would have for the audience here? How to think about it, how to approach this issue? Yeah, well, I mean, that's really interesting that you've got AI risk at the top, because I think that there are many companies that don't understand that. And, and so good self-regulation, as I said, you know, the um, putting your principles into practice, using some of the frameworks that are available that we've created over the last 10 or 14 years. Um, and uh, so thinking about it from bottom to top, procurement. Um, how, if you're procuring AI, who are your suppliers and how, what good questions are you asking of your suppliers? Um, if you're creating artificial intelligence or if you're using it, you know, um, ensuring that the C-suite is giving permission to people throughout the company to understand that responsibility and being careful in their use of, the, of AI actually is a, is a top factor. Right. Uh, a lot of companies, particularly AI companies and tech companies tend to, you know, they tend to um, uh, reward people for moving fast. But it's important that you reward people for moving fast, but also carefully and responsibly, because that's the way that you avoid risks. Exactly, yeah. And um, I think one of the other things that we talk about is the board. You know, um, a lot of companies don't have anybody with any technical expertise on their board. So you either need to bring someone in or you need to be um, saying, well, we'll also have an advisory board just around this around area. And of course, you as CEO, you know, every AI, co every company is an AI company now. Yeah. And you as CEO, you can't do your job without understanding it and looking to the future of your work with yeah. AI. You know, I'm a director also. On Besides being my director in my own company, I'm a director in uh, the second largest insurance company in the United States. It's called Elevance Health. And you think about providing healthcare uh, and the use of AI is so complex. It's just unbelievable. And that's one of the reasons I'm in the board is because Gail, the CEO, is transforming the company to provide better healthcare, a lower cost, and then use the power of the data to really become more predictive and proactive in that. But the challenge is that with all the regulations around with the United States called HIPAA compliance and data privacy and, and the like, it's very difficult yeah. to, to execute. Now, maybe um, as we think about AI, what are the implications to business and society from your vantage point of view? Yes, well, I think that um, obviously there are all the ethical principles that we've, we've talked about in the past, things like um, bias and discrimination, explainability, accountability, privacy. But also, I think one thing that we're not thinking about is enough is perhaps data, and especially in terms of the generative models. So what you probably don't know is that although there are about 100 million users of ChatGPT, um, there are actually, and most of those are in the US, and most of them are male, 
Um, in fact, there are a, three, three billion people who are not connected to the internet. So if your business or your business opportunities are in, particularly in the global south, then you, the, the glamour of the internet and being able to use generative AI over the internet must really fail because they're not connected. <laughs> and so whilst um, the internet data is really useful, um, if you're serving US or Europe, it probably isn't um, in other areas. But also, uh, the bulk of the data is around men. And you were talking about healthcare. Um, the bulk of the data about heart attacks is on 55-year-old white men living in America. Yeah, well, you I'm could, one of them. <laughs> well, you could <laughs> say that they're the people who mostly have heart attacks. No, but I don't if, say that. I want to live long. I mean, <laughs> quite. <laughs> but if you are a company who wants to serve women for having heart attacks, then that data is not useful no, to you at right. all. And the, what we know, of course, is that the data about women and people of color on the internet is minuscule compared to the right. data collected. But you, talk, you touch the topic is dear to my heart. I think about the connectivity aspects, and we both you know, contribute to the World Economic Forum. And one of the things I said a few years ago, I mean, we can talk about the great digital transformation we live in, but when you have millions of people, or maybe even potentially billions of people with no connectivity, it, that's a major problem. We are not being inclusive. We are actually creating divide in the society. And to me, connectivity is not different than water and electricity. It's a basic essential services that everybody should get access to. Maybe the last question. I know we can go along from here. I'm sure this particular audience will, will catch up with you offline. Maybe the opposite. Well, what is you? And then maybe we end with what, why you are optimistic. OK, yes. Well, why don't we look at sustainability? Um, because I think you know, what worries me about the use of AI is that at the moment, AI is more energy greedy than the aviation industry. And by 2030, we estimate um, AI emissions will be at 3.7% of global emissions. We see the cloud currently at 1.5% of global emissions. And we know that just um, having one average model it can be five times the average lifetime of a car in the United States. So this is a very thirsty, energy thirsty and emission problem um, industry. But if you look at the wonderful side of AI, and I think you know, we wouldn't be talking here if we don't, didn't both believe in the transformative um, uh, powers of AI, we can see that if you run AI over your energy uh, use, you can get up to 40% savings on energy. So that's fabulous. Uh, water leaks in, in factories uh, and are at about 25%. Uh, using AI to monitor water use, you can save not only the leaks, but also the wastage. And I think probably one of the most interesting things is that there are 17 billion defective items made and sent back what each year around the world. 17 billion. Um, that accounts for 4.7 me million metric tons of carbon emissions. And if we reduce that just by 10%, those thirst, US thirsty, energy thirsty houses, we could actually power 57,000 of them. You can also use AI to calculate your carbon emissions. And I think my, my takeaway would be, as with all things AI, you think carefully before you use it, think carefully before you um, create a model, but if you create the right models, you're going to have enormous success, and yeah. it can be a success for the planet as well. Yeah, think about it, we just talked before with Manuvi, right? So think about this waste, you know, billion of defective things being built, 
And if you use computer vision or the digital twin, as we talked before, you know, you can actually remove all that waste as much as you can. We as a company are building that AI cloud in, in spaces, in locations, where we actually are driving to a carbon neutral or carbon negative footprint. One of the, the little things that Justin, I'm looking at him, is building the cloud. Actually, we're going to use 99% renewable energy, but then the waste, which is the hot water, is going to feed the greenhouses which are in that location to grow vegetables. Therefore, we create a negative carbon footprint. That's why you have to start with you know, sustainability in mind. Think about the implications of ethics and how you use that data. But ultimately, take advantage of this amazing technology to advance the way we live and work. And so thank you very much, Kay, for sharing your experience. Thank you for taking such a permanent role in driving this dialogue with the industry. We are proud to work with you, and as always, uh, eager to help as much as we can. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Big round of applause to Kay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here in beautiful Barcelona, what an incredible opportunity to be together today. It would not have been possible without the many sponsors, including our Emerald level sponsor, Intel. I would also like to thank our platinum sponsor, AMD, Microsoft, NVIDIA, as well as our additional sponsors for their partnerships in making HP Discover Barcelona a reality. So thank you to you all. Today, we have showcased the potential of AI and addressed its challenges, emphasizing the critical importance of ethics and sustainable design from the start. The insights provided by our game-changing customers and industry leaders have underscored the importance of a data-first approach that's inherently AI-native and hybrid by design. Personally, I've been with the company for so long that makes me so proud of the bold innovations we announced, not just today, but in the past few years. And it shows how HPE is at the forefront of this transformation, innovating and evolving to guide you uh, as you implement the most effective AI and hybrid cloud strategy for your organization. Now we step into a future that's bound only by the limits of our creativity. So let's shape the future together and turn our collective vision into reality. So thank you for here being this morning. I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of the show. Go attend all the keynotes and the spotlight sessions. They can go one le level deeper on the technical side for those who are interested. But I'm really enthusiastic about engaging with you and continue the dialogue. And I have to say thank you to the marketing team and the event team because we actually are way oversubscribed, and that shows how important these events are, and we are committed to continue to this dialogue with you over the next weeks, months, and years to come. So thank you very much for your time.